So first of all, you want to start with a system that has defense in depth, has sort of layers built in by design, because each of the technologies have their own strengths and weaknesses, right? So I think it's often kind of the pictures of like stacking layers of Swiss cheese. So there's no you know hole that goes all the way through, right? And so to do that, we use... everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI podcast. I am your host, Sam Charrington. And today I'm joined by Sarah Bird. Sarah is Chief Product Officer of Responsible AI with Microsoft. Before we get going, be sure to take a moment to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to today's show. Sarah, welcome back to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me back. I'm thrilled to be here. It's great to have you back. It is very hard to believe that it's been, what, four and a half years or so since we last spoke? Yeah, a totally different time in AI, right? It just feels like a a lifetime ago. It sure does. It sure does. The last time the focus of our conversation was on operationalizing responsible AI, making it kind of concrete and practical for folks. And I think we'll be talking about a lot of the same things thematically, but as you just mentioned, it's a very different world. It's a very different context. And uh, a lot of what organizations have to deal with now is changing as a result of the shift from quote unquote traditional AI, if we can call it that, to generative AI. Uh, So we'll be digging into all of that and what it means for enterprises in our chat today. But to get us started, I would love to have you share a bit about what you've been working on for the past four and a half years. (laughs) Yeah, um, you know, I think to kind of what you were saying, in some ways, it's the same thing, right? How do we take um, principles, right? You know, fairness, transparency, accountability, reliability, safety, privacy, security. How do we actually put those into practice in AI applications? Uh, in how you build an application, how you operate an application, how you use an application. But what has you know completely changed is actually doing this for generative AI because the the sort of set of tools and techniques and the way we do it is um, is different. And so we're all we're inventing a new toolkit, we're learning a new toolkit. Um, and so you know that's really what I've spent uh, the last couple of years doing, uh, starting with. Um, GPT-3 and when we put it into production for GitHub Copilot and really figure out how do we build a large scale generative AI application. And uh, and so we've been going at that for a while and have really started to develop kind of new tools and techniques, um, but it's still the very early days. So I think, you know, there's a lot more to go do here. Um, you know, I'd like to start the conversation from the perspective of like just thinking through and and talking through really risks and challenges when you're out talking to customers as well as uh, on your internal projects like uh, Copilot and others, uh, what are the, the risks and challenges that you face and like, how do you think about those? I mean, a lot of those we hear about all the time, hallucinations and uh, jailbreaks and things like that, but do you have like a, a mental framework or, or taxonomy, I guess is a better word for thinking about the various risks presented by generative AI? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And it's something that we've been working on for a while. Actually, one of the most, um, let's say, memorable moments in my career was when um, we first got GPT-4. So this was like, it had just finished um, training the base model. There was no post-training yet or anything. And Actually, uh, the first people at Microsoft uh, that got to touch it along with, you know, some of the senior leadership were responsible AI experts um, to actually red team the technology to figure out what what could it do. And uh, it was a, a wild experience to have something that was so like obviously so much more powerful than previous versions of the technology. When you like the moment that I touched it or anybody else on the team touched it, you knew like wow, this is something different, but you didn't really know what was possible. And so we pulled experts across, you know, a large variety of areas looking at um, things, as you said, like uh, adversarial inputs, like now what we call jailbreaks or prompt injection attacks, looking at uh, errors like hallucination, looking at the ability to produce copyright material, 
Um, but also other things like, can it generate novel malware? Can it generate harmful content? You know, so we took that and and sort of built out a taxonomy and that helped also uh, guide a lot of our work. And I think what we'll see in kind of future generations as well. And so certainly there's the list of harms that we see, or, or let's say risk that we see that we're focusing on right now. So adver- adversarial inputs being one, um, you know, we call this prompt injection attacks, uh, errors, um, hallucination is obviously the one that sort of captures people's attention, but omission is actually, um, can be like equally important. So for example, if you're summarizing a um, medical, you know, transcript or medical information, if you omit a key symptom, then you might actually be sort of totally changing the, the meaning of that or changing what like the diagnosis might be or something. And so we look at kind of both sides of those types of errors. Um, we look at the ability to produce harmful content, harmful code, the ability to produce this copyright um, type material or, or IP material. And then some more abstract things like um, this is a totally new interface, right? And the thing that's exciting about the interface is that it is it does like one of the most human-like things. It speaks human language, um, but it is not human. Uh, and that's that is a meaningful distinction. And so looking at, you know, making sure that the people understand the system, the system is not sort of confusing and manipulating them. So we look at sort of questions of how should that interface look? And um like one of the challenging problems with this, for example, is uh, the phrase, I think. We use the phrase, I think, to you know signal that we might not be certain of something, right? That's like one usage right. of it. But does that imply the system is thinking? Does that imply that it's conscious or something, right? And right. so um, you know, we kind of dig into all of it's that. It's a pretty loaded term. Yeah. Um, and so uh, those are like kind of the places where we're spending our time. There's like a much, much larger sort of list of Tech, uh, taxonomy that we look at. But there's probably one key insight we had early on in this red teaming that helped us sort of realize, like, what are we trying to address? And one was a lot of these risks are sort of content types that are being produced that may be undesirable, like harmful code. Um, and then the other type of risk is sort of model capabilities or model limitations that are problems. So like hallucination, it, it like accidentally misusing data or something, that's a, a model behavior. And so we kind of take an approach where we look both at which types of content do we have to go after and which model behaviors um, or we sometimes say model tendencies do we have to go after. And so we look at kind of those two dimensions. In the past, when we when we spoke uh, in particular and and we as a community talked about responsible AI, a lot of the focus was on uh, concepts like fairness and bias, which, you know, we would try to make concrete in measurements and things like that. Um, But they feel like different types of concepts than hallucination and jailbreaking and adversarial attacks, which feel more like security. Like, do you feel that you know, has there been a, a shift from, you know, one type of con- concept to another or uh, is, you know, fairness and bias kind of a, an umbrella to, you know, the other types of concerns that we're dealing with today? How do you think about the relationship between uh, these types of ideas? Yeah, I think um, so. I see them as, um, you know, side by side, like fairness is one principle, sort of security is another principle we have. Um Certainly, fairness and bias is really important in these applications. We um, uh, say that like one of the, the top types of fairness you see in this is representational fairness. How are people represented by the AI system, right? You don't want content to be stereotyping or um, you don't want it to be like overrepresenting a group or underrepresenting a group, right? And we see that a lot as a challenge still today in like text to image generation where you put in a, a particular you know, query, I want a woman in a dress. And often you end up with kind of images that are all very similar to each other. So it looks like it's overrepresenting a group and sort of underrepresenting everyone. And so these issues are still very much something that we need to work on and, and we address in the systems. But I agree with your point that uh, we are spending a lot more time than we used to on the adversarial elements and the security pieces and ensuring that 
the systems can only be used as intended and that they can't be misused and looking at things like, you know, secure by design for that. And so there's definitely a much bigger emphasis on that part than it used to be. Um, but I don't think that people are, you know, think that like fairness and bias is, is less important. It's, it is um, equally pr- important concern. There was a recent uh, example that put the idea of representational bias in imagery on a lot of people's, you know, radar. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what we can learn from kind of these, you know, big uh, public Gen AI failure cases. Certainly, Microsoft is familiar with this. Uh, you had one of the first with Tay, kind of pre Gen AI. Uh, but then there was like the Kevin Roos article on Bing around the time that the Bing with AI launched. Google recently had the whole pizza glue fiasco thing. Like what what is there to learn from these public failures? I would say everything, right? Like the uh, part, of, <laughs> I mean, they, like all of this is a learning journey. We're taking a very new technology and then using it in like, totally novel ways and in many different applications in the world. So, you know, we're going to be learning for a really long time, um, I think, and and there will be more mistakes as well. Um, I think that the, the thing that's important uh, is to make sure we are sort of contained in the learning, right? Trying to sort of take calculated risks, like there's some failures that are acceptable, there's some failures that are are not and so I think from if we take the two sort of Microsoft examples, um, you know, first, uh, Tay. Tay was actually even before our Responsible AI program had really started. Uh, certainly there were some kind of rumblings of the idea of AI ethics and research, but um, it wasn't as, uh, you know, as a significant um, thing in practice in companies. And uh, And so I think people were just so, like shocked kind of just that this had happened right i think people did not sort of go in prepared for that uh, and and you know people inside microsoft and people you know involved as well um and so i think that was re- that's like a good experience to have in microsoft's history because it is a reminder of just how important this is all the time and and really sort of what is at stake um and so i think we uh, have changed a lot since then. We started our, you know, Office of Responsible AI uh, implemented a Responsible AI standard. You know, we, we don't put that into practice. And so it's just sort of night and day from how it was with um, with Tay. Now, uh, Kevin Roos' uh, example um, was something that, you know, this was you know, right after we launched Bing Chat. Uh, Kevin Roos went and spent a lot of time interacting with, uh, with Bing Chat and, uh, ended up with a, let's say, kind of um, more (laughs) emotional, uh, deranged, (laughs) uh, uh, I think many people found highly highly entertaining uh, experience because I believe Mm -hmm. that was actually one of the most read New York Times articles of all time. Uh, So one thing we learned is like, wow, like exactly. One thing we learned was people are really paying attention, right? Like the entire world is Mm -hmm. really interested in this technology and and how it behaves. Another interesting learning from that is we knew when we were um, launching Big Chat and GPT-4, like one of the things that was very top of mind for me the entire time was such a new interface and it's so much more powerful than the previous version of the technology. So we knew people were going to interact with it differently, but we didn't know how they were going to act with it, interact with it differently. Like, you know, we had some ideas, we had done a lot of internal testing, so we had a feel for what people were doing, but the technology can do a lot of different things. It's a pretty broad surface area, you know, combined with a search engine, there's a lot, a lot there. Um, and so we, uh, we had built a, a testing system and we had been testing conversations, but we really focused a lot of our energy on testing conversations that were around 10 turns, were you know, a little bit shorter uh, because like most search engine interactions were like single turn. Maybe you like refine a query and that's it. Um, and so even 10 so turns 10 was, was like, a long wow, tail that's at the a time. long conversation. And then <laughs> we did not expect people to be talking for like three hours in the in the middle of the, <laughs> the night or whatever, uh, going, you know, many, many turns deep. And so um, it sort of showed a, a limitation in how we had been testing the system. But on the other hand, um, you know, we were able to fix it really quickly. And that's something we did design. Like, uh, as I said, we knew, like, it was very top of mind for me that 
we are not going to know every way people are going to use the system. So as we put it on a preview, we're going to have to learn, we're going to have to adapt. So we had built a system so we could make very quick adjustments to the different responsible AI controls and actually be able to adjust. And so uh, actually one of the quickest things we did there was just limit how long the conversations could be so that you couldn't have this very long form conversation where the system kind of contextually drifted over and over into a, a stranger place. Um, but, you know, there's still, we're, we're still going to keep learning from these, these kind of experiences. Um, and then I think, you know, to the, the Google example, right? Uh, all of us are, are learning. And I think there are challenges with this technology. And what I was saying of like the technology, it's a big surface area. There's a lot of different things there. Which people are going to use them for many different queries. People use Google for a lot, right? So, and um, so if they're pulling from, uh, you know, all sorts of sources on the internet, of course, some of those are going to have inaccurate information. And so that's a real challenge, I think, in terms of, you, you know, how to use information effectively to sort of summarize things. And uh, it's not a challenge that anyone is sort of immune to right now. It's something that we're very actively working on, because the way to make these systems really successful is putting high quality data into them. When you think about... Um... You know, maybe from the perspective of the way that you've kind of architected these deployed systems there or uh, what customers need to have in place so that, you know, when one of their deployed products, you know, does things that they weren't intending, like what is, what is the system need to look like so that you can rapidly respond to, um, you know, the types of examples that we just discussed, you know, you know, clearly like if you weren't planning to be able to address those things in advance, it would take you a lot longer than it took to, uh, you know, turn off whatever, you know, the change the length in this case, or, to, you know, turn a filter, I guess is another common example. Like, is there a way to kind of generalize the systems or layers that need to be in place in order to be able to respond quickly? Yeah, there's a um, there's a lot there. Uh, I think so. First of all, you want to exactly as you said, you want to start with a system that has defense in depth, has sort of layers built in by design, because each of the the technologies have their own strengths and weaknesses, right? So I think it's often kind of the pictures of like stacking layers of Swiss cheese. So there's no you know hole that goes all the way through, right? And so um, you know we to do that. We use, um, obviously, safety built into the model itself through um, techniques like reinforcement learning with human feedback. Um, we use an auxiliary safety system that looks at all the inputs going in, looks at all the outputs coming out, can block those in real time. Um, and that, of course, uses a, a mix of technologies like classifiers, but also things that are faster twitch so you can respond quickly, like um, block lists, right, or embeddings or things where we can very quickly add an additional assertion. Um, uh, the model of post training is something you can do maybe on the the weekly basis if you want to, but certainly not a kind of incident level. Um, same thing with the classifiers. It's like we have fast twitch in the safety system, and then stuff that we can update more in the, the speed of a week. And then um, the you know one of the most powerful elements is actually the system uh, message where the program you're giving the the model because I think we've all seen the. The models will behave very differently uh, depending what what instructions you put in there, um, including like small changes in which word. And so that's a very powerful thing that you can change uh, very, very quickly. Um, and, you know, maybe uh, for us, that's about it. like something like adding to a block list we can do, you know, in a minute and it's in the production system. Something like changing the meta prompt, we can do it in about a day. Um, and the reason is it's pretty easy to go in and change the meta prompt, but or, or system message. We say meta prompt more often internally, but you know, system message, meta prompt, uh, same words. Um, you can really you can go and change it really quickly, but it's going to change your whole application behavior. And so it's not something that you want to do without rerunning your test. And so to be able to effectively change the system message, we had to build both automated quality tests 
and automated tests for all the different types of risk we wanted to be looking at as well so that when we make that intervention, we can rerun our testing suite, see if the system's still performing well before we kind of ship that update. And so like to be able to move fast there involves not only having the mechanism to change the system prompt, but the testing that allows us to know that that intervention is actually safe. And so we actually see that kind of pattern at every level where uh, you need to have both the the intervention mechanism, but the, and the testing that ensures that the intervention doesn't break something else. For example, you don't um, add a word to the block list that is going to cause uh, a lot of you know over blocking in an unexpected way. Um, so, for example, in GitHub Copilot, uh, one of the words that was on like an early block list um, was race, uh, and they meant it in the natural language sense, but then it. Uh, blocks like everything, everything where they had written like race condition or things like that, right? And people hadn't thought about kind of that use of it. And so we build in testing that allows you to understand like what would be blocked and what not so that you don't have as much of that kind of collateral damage. Um, so that building all of that is one part of it. And then the other part and is I'm actually- I'm envisioning there, mm-hmm. I'm envisioning there, you know, something akin to kind of traditional DevOps CI, CD, someone adds a, an assertion to a block list or- uh, changes the system prompt and it automatically kicks off some set of regression tests. Uh, and, you know, there's a red light or a green light at the end and then someone pushes a button to deploy. Is it, you know, yeah. essentially that same idea? Yeah, it, it is um, exactly the same concept with one difference, which is often like, what are you testing, right? In this case, what you really need to do is look at your data distribution and understand the behavior over the like specific examples. And so a lot of the ways that we need to build these tests are ensuring that you have sort of representative data samples or you're like sampling your production traffic so that you know this intervention is not going to sort of really change how the system responds to like, let's say your most common prompts or something. And so um, it's exactly the the implication that at the end of this testing pipeline, uh, you know, a human needs to look at the results and do some analysis and that there can't be, or you're not trying to get to a kind of red light, green light type of a situation, or, um, just that the nature of the tests are different. It's not break, not break. It's, you know, distributional, but you can still, automate it to a determination of whether it's good or not. What should, I guess the question I'm trying to get at is like for folks that are building these kinds of systems, like how far should you be trying to get with, you know, this type of automation in the testing loop? Yeah, it's a really great question. I think for the testing for these like incident interventions where you want to go really quickly as much as possible, we do try to make it procedural. So let's say you add an intervention and now you, the, the block rate goes up from you know 0.2% of your traffic to 0.5% of your traffic. You probably want kind of rules that say, okay, 0.5 is acceptable for like an incident intervention. Um, but we certainly have experienced cases where the, let's say the, the incident is very high stakes. We want to take a very quick intervention, but the inve- intervention is also very high cost. Like it might have, you know, um, like much more collateral damage um, where it like blocks a lot more or it, it totally like shuts down example? a used case. Uh, yeah, let's see. It's usually just where I don't think I can think of a good one. It would, it's mostly just cases where like what the thing you need to block is like a really common word or something, right? Then that would probably take out like a lot more. Um, And so then, then you do need sort of human judgment in terms of who's, how, is this really the right trade-off and is it a longer term decision or is it just for the next hour until you can like ship a classifier update that's really going to more surgically solve the problem. And so um, we, you know, you're still going to need it there. I think the other thing we've seen in, in all of this kind of testing is, uh, you need human judgment to go in and say, what are the appropriate test results? Like what thresholds, what, um, what defect rate, for example, uh, is acceptable, which types of defects are acceptable, which are not. But when you once you've kind of decided for a particular application what that looks like, then you can rerun the testing really automatedly. But it's not that we can say, okay, uh, 
for, um, let's say, you know, um, like hateful content, the appropriate uh, defect rate is, you know, 1% errors and no more, right? Like it, it just varies depending on applications. Actually, probably a better example there would be hallucination. How much hallucination is acceptable is going to vary a lot depending on the application. So like a brain, an application where you're brainstorming, totally fine potentially if it like makes up a lot of content. In fact, probably desirable. An application where you're doing a factual <laughs> lookup, let's say, in a search engine, then you want it to really stay, you know, sort of focused and grounded on that content. And so the the amount that would be appropriate is going to be different. Uh, on on that theme of hallucination, you alluded to this earlier in your comment about the word think, think and thinking, yeah. uh, but an element of um, both response, but also the initial delivery of these types of systems is like conveying the right expectations to the user and, you know, crafting that as part of the user experience. And I don't know that we've gotten much more advanced than chat GPT can make mistakes. Be, please review your results when you're using it for something important. Um, you know, have you seen, do you think that there are, you know, deeper opportunities to integrate, um, conveying the probabilistic nature, uh, or the potentially halluc hallucinated nature of results to, to users? Are we just, you know, not there yet, but there are opportunities or um, there, you know, are you not bullish on uh, a lot of progress there? No, I think uh, absolutely there's opportunities, right? We're, um, as I was saying earlier, we're in just the early days of all of this. Yeah. And so I think there's, there's so much opportunity to do many things better. Um, but I, and, and we'll like, we'll learn it is still an innovation space. So we're still figuring out how to do this, inventing new approaches. Um, I think that there are, um, quite, a, we did spend a lot of time on the user interface when we were designing, um, Bing Chad, which is, uh, now Microsoft Copilot. And, um, a couple, a couple things we did, for example, is very much on the, the landing page. We did have this, uh, the original statement that said, uh, you know, this is powered by AI surprises and mistakes are possible. And because uh, we wanted to emphasize that you also get <laughs> kind of those amazing, unexpected, good experiences like, wow, I didn't know it could do that or it would respond that way. Um, but we also, uh, for example, added um, uh, examples of what the technology could do. Like you can ask it this or it can do that because we knew it was just so no, new that people weren't going to really understand what it could do. Um, and then uh, we also added a um, shortly after launch a feature that allowed users to signal a little bit more about the task they're trying to achieve exactly to the hallucination example I was just uh, giving earlier, which is uh, users now can select if they want their answer to be um, creative and that would allow it to be, you know, less based on the search engine results, more uh, sort of brainstorming and creative, or if they want it to be balanced, kind of just the, the middle option, or they want it to be precise, where we've tuned the system to really focus on the search engine results when it's answering and, uh, and not deviate or add its own information. And so, um, for example, giving the users uh, some amount of control so that they can sort of have the system behave uh, aligned with what they're trying to achieve. Um, we also, you know, put references in from the beginning and the responses so that you can go and say, I, I feel that I should have confidence in this answer because it comes from a source that I think is, you know, high authority or not. Right. Um, and so, uh, we, you know, looked at quite a few different UI elements in addition to those that I've listed to help people really sort of better understand what the technology is and how to engage in it. And so um, I think there's still, as I said, a lot more to do there, but it is something that is incredibly important and probably something we're not talking about as much, like a lot more interest in like uh, alignment and, you know, things that we're doing with the model itself than, hey, how do we b design uh, better user interfaces so that people can use the, the technology effectively? When you talk about the idea of allowing the user to articulate their intent or degree of precision, does that slider influence the meta prompt or the model in some way, a combination of both? Like how is that ability uh, implemented? Yeah, it uh, influences both the meta prompt and the model. 
Um, so one of the things we did when we first built Precise Mode, for example, is we worked with OpenAI on post-training uh, RLHF for um, GPT-4 that really emphasized the model should stay only use sort of the grounding data in the context, and it should only ban- answer based on that. And so, you know, we gave it those types of examples. And if it deviated, we gave it a much lower score in the RLHF. And so we had a version of the model that was very much focused on that. But then in addition, uh, the meta prompt is a really powerful uh, thing to also help with that. So we usually are using a combination of techniques to address any of these things. You know, it strikes me that, you know, testing and evaluation is really the, the, the key here and having strong, you know, processes around these things. How do the testing and evaluation responsibilities shift uh, between if you're the model publisher, you know, which you might be in, in Microsoft or the model, you know, consumer or user or someone who's building around the model, like, uh, should you be thinking about testing and evaluation, you know, the same way. Some of the things that we discussed apply more than others. Like, how, is that a useful distinction in your experience? Um, and, and what do you see there? Yeah, it's a, it's a really important distinction because uh, when we're testing a model, we look at kind of three dimensions of things. We want to look at the capabilities, you know, how, how powerful is it? What can it actually do? We want to look at the uh, the dangerous capabilities as well, which is like, what's the worst of the worst that it can do if someone misuses it? Um, so it's another type of capability test, but, you know, kind of on the, on the negative side. Um, and then we look at alignment, um, which is, uh, you know, a set of tests to look at when you use this out of the box as intended, does it, you know, behave in the way you would expect, right? So if you ask a, a sensitive query, does it respond in a way that you would view as appropriate or is it, you know, like using a bunch of stereotypes or something instead, right? And so that last test of alignment. So we've built a suite of tests that are looking at these dimensions um, in, uh, you know, across, across different factors, across different risks um, uh, to, for the model itself. Now testing the application is is a little bit different because still kind of maybe the same concepts, but what you want to test is that your application behaves as you intended it to, uh, that it can't be misused, right? And so there you're typically doing kind of quality testing and then still doing like adversarial testing and then still doing kind of safety testing. But often what we're doing at the application level is going to be tailored more specifically to the application. We're going to test things like does it stay grounded? Um, and usually we're going to be testing in a way that uh, interacts with uh, the system more. So um, what I was telling you before about testing Bing Chat and testing 10 turns, right? our testing system is going to have like multiple interactions and then it actually um, actually scores you know, the outcome of that. And so actually the one of the most important things that we first built um, when we were um, developing uh, Bing Chat was this automated testing system. And as I said, it allowed us to actually be able to respond very quickly after the fact when we needed to. But that's what's also enabled us to tune all the safety mechanisms, right? To be able to just test the system every day and figure out if we needed to make adjustments to the safety system, if we needed to make adjustments to the meta prompt. Uh, and so uh, a lot of our investment has really been in building a robust testing system. And this is something we've been using internally for a while. And uh, we know that our customers have struggled with this also. And so we've um, just released this externally um, uh, called uh, Safety Evaluations in Azure AI. And it's, um, it's that application level testing system that allows people to, to, when they've built a complete application, to go and test it for these different types of risk. And so what is the experience of someone using that? Like, what's an example of how they might structure a, a test uh, and how does the system help them uh, run that test? Yeah. So what we found is for quality metrics, say um, relevance or coherence or fluency, um, but also uh, like groundedness, which is how we test for um, hallucination, those ones, the the data set you want is probably like a normal distribution of your kind of production data. And so most people have that, right? So 
what we have then is you bring your data and we are going to use AI to evaluate, like to, for, well, to first kind of run it. So uh, AI will usually like kind of simulate um, an interaction and then kind of score the output. But a lot of people, if you just even have production data, you could just score it. And so we have an AI scoring function that calculates all of these metrics for you. But on the responsible AI side, it it's very different in terms of most people do not have data sets that are that exercise these different risks. So, for example, if you're building um, newly building a generative AI application, you do probably do not have an inventory of many of the common prompt injection attacks and that you should be guarding your system against. And so, what we have done there is we have worked um, with Microsoft Research um, to develop a framework where we can articulate these risks and then actually um, sort of exercise them effectively. So we actually generate the inputs of the system for you. And then um, the user simulator goes and role plays the conversation or the interaction. um, And then AI again scores the output. And so um, for the output, what we've done is if you take, for example, our guidelines for hateful text content, those are actually uh, for human linguists, um, expert hum- human linguists, about 20 pages long. We've taken those and turned them into a prompt for GPT-4 with a lot of iteration to make sure it was staying quality. And then that is sort of the automatic scoring function that's in there. So we've had to add a lot more and build in a lot of more expertise for how do you score the output? How do you actually have a, the inputs that are really exercising that risk um, into the safety evaluation system so that people can just show up and kind of start running it and, and feel that they're, they're getting appropriate you know, levels of testing for their system? It's interesting that you're able to and kind of advocating the use of a, a single kind of tool experience across quality adversarial and safety tests, which can be a bit different. Yeah, it's still, these are all sort of still tests that are going through that same kind of like front door user interface. And so you're really just scoring against like a lot of a lot of different types of metrics and a lot of different types of inputs. So in some ways, it, you know, really looks the same. Um, there's certainly like other types of security testing you would want to do that are m- more traditional, like pen testing and things as well. Uh, one of the reasons why it's interesting that those are the same tools is that often the the teams that are doing those kinds of things are uh, slightly different, meaning the you know designers and engineers that are building the the new system uh, would be using something like the quality testing or performing quality testing, whereas uh, maybe a security team uh, is doing the safety testing, that kind of thing. And, and and maybe I should back up and say, what are you saying in terms of the way folks are organizing teams to perform this kind of testing? So it's actually a really great question and a a really important point. Uh, So when we have been building the testing, it is different teams that build those different metrics because you do need expertise. Like as we, you know, keep using the example of like prompt injection attacks, you need expertise in those particular tags uh, both to build that that part of that test or, or those tests. Um, same with quality, you want to have sort of uh, expertise in those metrics. Uh, but it's actually really important to run them all together and and actually be able to look at it holistically. And the reason is that we are still at the point where there are trade offs. Um, so, for example. Um, We had uh, one change to the meta prompt that we were looking at pre-production where when we changed it, we saw maybe like a 5% drop in, um, I think, uh, like perceived relevance, but we saw like a 50% drop in sort of the, the number of jailbreaks that can get through. Right. And so we would say, okay, 5%, that's like a, a, maybe a pretty big quality drop. Maybe we don't want to take that. Ooh, but it's a huge gain in sort of safety and adversarial robustness. And hopefully you can keep iterating and maybe find a place where you don't have to make as big of a trade-off, where you can still get the benefits in the, you know, the adversarial robustness uh, without seeing the quality drop. But sometimes there is a trade-off. And so we really want to look at kind of the whole suite of metrics together. And so we do have sort of a, a single team that is, you know, 
looking at that. But then, of course, uh, if like if there's a drop in a particular metric, usually there are experts to call, consult to say, is this OK? Uh, you know, how should we think about this? So it's still you know, going to be a conversation, um, but it's really important to look at all of them together. You know, we've talked quite a bit about red teaming thus far. Is that something that um, you expect organizations to do again? Is it where does it fall in this? You know, model provider versus model user perspective. Does every enterprise need to have a team and an approach to do red teaming for all of their AI products, or um, you know, is there some? Uh, metric that you should be thinking about when you need that. Uh, I imagine the importance of the or the risk risk assessment is kind of at the core of this. You know, talk through how to think about um, how much to invest in this kind of testing and red teaming and that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, so red teaming is a really important tool that we use, um, but we use it in a variety of ways. So I gave the example earlier of bringing together this expert red team to figure out what GPT-4 could even do, right? So in that case, we were using red teaming for risk identification. And um, there, it's kind of novel risk identification. Like, we don't even know what the risk of this technology are. That's something that the model provider can do, something that needs to be done, you know, kind of once. So it's not something that every single you know model user needs to be doing as far as like what is the technology even capable of right we publish a you know a model card and list of these different risks and sort of um, guides about how to think about them uh, but then we also use red teaming as a sort of pre-ship validation so in addition to running the automated testing that we talked about sometimes we supplement that with red teaming because there we have experts who can maybe go uh, go deeper or identify something that the automated testing was missing. And we use these in, in, um, in combination. So for example, if we go and see the red team, the red team like gets through and finds a somewhat interesting vulnerability in the system, we then will go and automate or uh, augment the automated testing so that we better understand how is that behaving overall at scale and also keep tracking it going forward. Now, we, we don't red team every application. Um, part of our commitments to the, the White House last year were that we uh, will red team every sort of high risk uh, application or sort of high impact application. And so if something is a very standard like document Q&A uh, chatbot, then we usually don't bring in red teaming for that. We, we focus on the automated evals. But if it's a really um, sort of like an application in a more sensitive domain, an application that's very like powerful or more general purpose, then we will use the red teaming. And so I, I would recommend that organizations sort of think about it similarly in terms of uh, ongoing red teaming is where you have something that is more novel or high risk and you want to be really certain. But if it's kind of just um, a, a bread and butter application that you understand, then it's also reasonably that you can kind of build automated testing that tests that appropriately. It sounds like an important way that you approach this and that, that you recommend others approach this is aligning the resources and the testing and other aspects of the uh, system or application delivery to the risk assessment. And I know you're a fan of the NIST AI risk management framework uh, as a way to think about all this. Can you kind of introduce us to the framework and why you like it as a way of thinking about these these various risks? The, the RMF has been around for a while, but I think they just recently released a generative AI extension. So I like it because I think it's a sort of simple, easy to understand framework. Um, Microsoft, uh, our response by standard is public. So um, you can go and check out, you know, sort of what are our requirements and how we do it. But the way our standard is organized, it's organized by principle. So here's what needs to be done for fairness. Here's what needs to be done for transparency. And that's one way to look at it. Uh, the NIST framework is more uh, what needs to be done kind of life cycle wise. And so I think sometimes it's easier for people to think about it in that way. Um, so the first uh, step is map. Uh, so that's risk identification. You need to map the risk. So the GPT-4 red teaming example is exactly that. We need to go map the risks that are, are sort of possible. 
um, the next step is measure. And that's really important because once you understand the risk, really the first thing you should be doing is figuring out how am I going to effectively measure these risks? And that could be through like ongoing red teaming. Um, but, you know, our first investment, as I was sharing with Bing Chat, was going and building the testing systems so we could start actually testing for these risks. And the testing systems allowed us to then do sort of the third step in this, which is manage uh, and allowed us to design those layers of mitigations that I was talking about earlier, because we had ongoing testing. So every every new thing we wanted to experiment with, do we think this technique will work? Do we think this you know classifier will, will work well here, et cetera? All of that we had powered by testing. So we could make data-driven dr- decisions about if we were effectively managing the risk. Um, and then the last part um, is really uh, govern, right? All of, you know, you can use all of the techniques and go through the process, but you need governance um, in the organization to ensure that those steps are actually being taken. And that's a really, um, really important one, um, particularly in a fast moving space. Like what we've seen is the technology is changing so quickly. It's actually very hard to keep even like a large organization like Microsoft uh, that's quite sophisticated in this up to date on what are all the latest risks, what are all the latest management techniques that they need to do. And so um, having that backing sort of governance, both structure, but then like operational approach that allows you to have safeguards in place and checks and balances to ensure that stuff isn't being missed as the, the playbook evolves really quickly has been something that's really important for us. And is that what, what's the implementation of that governance? Is it, uh, you know, a leader, a committee, an organization, uh, you know, you mentioned playbook, uh, a combination of all these, I imagine, like, how do you see it uh, playing out uh, with customers? Yeah, I think it, it is a combination of um, all of these, probably two sort of practical elements that have been very important for us, but we've also, uh, I've seen it been really important for customers. First is that leadership level thing. Um, so the thing that uh, we were talking about, the testing, right? There's real trade-offs between quality and safety. Um, that also plays out in a bigger scale, right? As you try to transform your organization with AI, uh, you have to decide which types of risk you want to take. And it might not be a safety risk. It might be a risk for your, for your business. It might be a risk in terms of the customer reaction, uh, or it might be that it does change your you know, security posture or something a little bit. And so having that committee sort of at the top that can kind of make those decisions for, in an informed way for the company is something that's been really important. Um, the other element that we have implemented is a, um, and many, many customers as well, is a um, review, you know, release process and making sure that there's expert review um, sort of before an application is released. So we have um, teams of sort of uh, risk assessors that go in and exactly sort of map the risk for an application, look to make sure appropriate testing has taken place according to those risks, and that there's appropriate mitigations in place aligned with those risks, and then have that whole um, sort of package reviewed to say this looks like it's actually sort of ready to be released. And so uh, that's another element that's been been really important. Um, of course, then, uh, you know, culture and all of these things play into it as well. But those are the two pieces that we really see um, organizations kind of moving to implement to be able to do this uh, successfully. You know, given how fast things are evolving, I imagine it is uh, difficult to kind of predict the future and, and you know, where things are headed. But are there, you know, things that uh, either you're particularly excited about or, you know, based on your experience, how do you think about the, the future with regards to uh, testing and safety for generative AI systems? Yeah. Maybe I'll first say, um, actually, one of the things I'm the most excited about is recent history. Uh, so not not the future, but we, we're still sort of um, exploiting what's possible here. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the amazing things about generative AI is it's actually a huge step forward in terms of responsible AI or safety um, kind of toolkit. Uh, so I shared earlier that our testing system, for example, 
we have an automated scoring function that scores um, like our actual expert human linguist. This is something that previous versions of the technology could not do at all. And so we went from, we are not able to test uh, very well. Like we're able to test only with humans, which meant that it could be only like outer loop testing where, okay, you've basically built the entire application. You're going to do one final like validation check that can go to, you know, human labelers and say, okay, it kind of looks good, right? Where when we're able to build the automated version now, because of this technology, we are able to turn that into inner loop testing, which means we can actually tune and improve and innovate on how much better we can get at responsible AI in the application while we're developing the application rather than it being more like a final check. And so mm -hmm. uh, that's kind really of the key. obvious quip there is like, who's minding the minders. But I, I think you addressed that in this idea that you're automating the inner loop. So you're able to catch issues quicker, but you still have the outer loop that is providing the same level of checks as you had before. Yeah, exactly. And we're still um, like the I was saying that function, we, you know, had it score like the human as we, you know, we check that regularly. Is it still scoring, you know, as well as those? Right. So there's also kind of um, different points. There's also we're, minding we're, the minder. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, and so that's like one example of how it's a breakthrough. Another one is um, a challenge with um, let's let's say like hateful content. There's different um, stereotypes all over the world. There's different statements that would be hateful in one context and not in another. And it's very hard to pull together like all of that data. Well, the system is actually, um, the models have been trained on a lot of, you know, the data from kind of all over the internet. And so they are actually really, I'm going to say great in this sense, uh, terrible in another sense, but really great at generating that type of content. And so we actually use it to produce a lot more synthetic data to augment our safety models. Um, and it's a feature, on, not a bug. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's like, uh, you know, tools and weapons, it's all how you use it. So the behavior I'm trying to prevent in most applications, which is generate harmful content, is one of the best things about these models for me, because I'm able to use that to build the safety system that allows us to make applications safe. But uh, that the fact that they understand language, they understand content, uh, co they understand nuance so much better, makes them better for building safety classifiers from as well, right. And so uh, the we feel like we just have this huge step forward in the toolkit that it's available to us. And that's unlocked so much innovation in responsible AI. And so that's the thing I'm the most excited about. And I think we're just, uh, you know, at the very beginning of what's possible there. And so as the technology gets better, I think we'll also see more kind of be possible with that. So that's one of the things that in my everyday life, I'm, I'm very, very excited about with the technology. So does that mean I won't be able to get you to look into the crystal ball? <laughs> you know, I... <laughs> Uh, I think actually I really like something that um, Kevin Scott uh, says to uh, to us frequently, which is, uh, you know, the technology appears to be sort of on this exponential curve, and uh, but you only get kind of an update every two years or something. And so certainly when we we you know we had three five and then four came, we were kind of blown away. But every time you get each new data point, you kind of go back to like a linear existence. Like it's very hard to predict what would an exponential jump look like again. So we're, you know, back on our like linear life and then we'll see if the next technology is an exponential. And so I think I am I am prepared to be surprised, but I don't know in, you know, what directions, right? Some of what what emerged with GPT-4 isn't what we expected and some, you know, is what we expected. And so um, I think that uh, I'm in the keeping an open mind and waiting and seeing what will happen. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that regardless of what happens, it will be surprising in different ways. A, a way that you process that question about the future is asking, does GPT-5 like change or obviate all of this or is it, um, you know, is does it require incremental adaptation? And it sounds like you're not you're not sure at all. 
Yeah. And that's a question we ask ourselves <laughs> all the time, right? Okay. Like, look, we're building all of these different prompt engineering tools. Are we going to be doing prompt engineering with GPT-5 or is it going to be so much smarter that you don't need all of that, right? I think it's very, very hard to predict those types of things. Um, I feel confident that no matter what the next jump in technology is, we're still going to want to test it for different types of risks, right? We'll probably have to add some new ones to our standard playbook, but we're still going to have to you know, have robust testing systems. Um, I believe very much in uh, the, um, the, let's say the the kind of the core idea of RAG, which is you bring the model together with uh, contextual data, with fresh data, with relevant data. And so like, I think we're still going to have data retrieval or data augmentation in some form in future applications. And so all the work people are doing to uh, make their data pipelines stronger, get the right data to the model, all of that's probably still going to be durable. But um, for example, uh, other things may not be durable. So one of the things happened with GPT, um, the jump between three and four is the first application we built was GitHub Copilot. And we um, fine-tuned GPT-3 with the you know, code data to make that possible. Otherwise, it would never have had the quality. When GPT-4 came out, it was way better at code than GPT-3. So in essence, like all of that fine-tuning work was thrown away. And it was totally worth it for Microsoft because we we got that application to market sooner. We kind of you know made the market. We got a year of learning in the market with that. And so even though it was sort of throwaway in that sense, it was totally worth the investment. But like something I tell customers all the time is if that happens to you, if the next generation is so much better than your fine-tuned thing, if you're going to feel that that was a waste, then you probably should not go invest in it right now because that's like a real risk that's out there. And so you have to make the decision for yourself. Does it look like GitHub Copilot where you're still going to be happy with the outcome or not? But it's certainly a thing we're doing all the time right now is like, what's going to be durable? What's going to be not? And, you know, there's certainly places where it's very hard to predict uh, and people are making a lot of predictions and it'll be interesting to see which ones are right. Absolutely. Well, Sarah, thanks so much for jumping on to chat a bit about what you've been up to and uh, the way you think about AI safety. It has been wonderful catching up. Yeah, it's been great as always. Thank you so much for having me and looking forward to talking sometime again in the future. 